So I have the um, uh, task of kind of coming to the last part of this and um, I have a few things that I would like to talk to you about. The first thing is that um, as you had heard, this is the beginning. This is really the just the beginning. So if we were going to think about what's next on the horizon, well, one thing that we're really interested in, as um, we had indicated earlier, is about the Michigan Promise Scholarship. Um, as we explained, this was sunsetted, but nonetheless, again, it represents one of those natural experiments, given the fact that we have all this information on the students over time, because we're able to connect it to the National Student Clearinghouse data, that we really are going to be able to look at this perhaps in ways that it's never been done before, and Sue will be leading that effort. The next thing is that we gave you a little bit of just what I would call a touch of kind of thinking about things and how things vary on the basis of income and race and ethnicity, but um, we're, you know, that group of uh, researchers that really want to go deep on some of these questions. We certainly are interested if there are issues related to gender. We're also issues, is interested in questions about age and then at a larger level, school and district characteristics. And what about those school and district characteristics? So here again, we're looking at not only the student, but the context in which the student is in. And we will be able to do different kinds of comparisons by schools and by districts. And then we're going to be able to do something that we think is really quite novel in the sense that we're going to be able to look at course taking and its effect on achievement and on post-secondary attendance and really persistence as well if we have we're hoping um, we'll get those kind of data and we'll put those and add that to our file as well and then finally as we explain there are a lot of things here that aren't answered so we have to be able to go deeper into our schools and figure out are there school organization and personnel changes that occurred that were in response to the MMC or that predicated the MMC. So how do you go about doing something like that? Well, the best way really to think about doing that is to go deep into schools. Now, we have a lot of high schools in this state, so we can't go into every high school in the state. Um, it's one of the reasons why we have the National Center for Education Statistics, because in the 1940s, there's some people that came up with some really good ways of what we call sampling, so we don't have to go in and talk to every single school, but we can draw a sample of schools and that sample of schools will give us a generalizable probability sample of all the schools in the state. So how do you do that? Well, you got to look at all the schools in the state and you have to figure out, mm-hmm, well, if we were going to try and build a generalizable sample of schools, we need to know something about who's in those schools. So what's the race and ethnicity of those schools? Where are those schools located? How big, how small are those schools? What kind of grade levels do they have? Is there some sort of unique configuration of those schools that in fact makes them somehow different that makes them either in a generalizable sample or out a generalizable sample. So when you're building this sort of probability sample, you have to do what's called, you gotta stratify. You have to stratify on these kinds of factors to be able to build a probability sample of a number of schools in the state. And then you have to worry about, well, how many of those schools do you need? for it to really be a powerful sample that in fact when you got through with it you could say, aha, this looks like something that 
would really hold up for all the other kinds of high schools that were in the state. And if we just wanted to look at urban schools, would we have enough urban schools with low income minority students in them to be able to make any kinds of differences across them be real? So could we have enough power to be able to say something about those schools? Well, what we did um, is we went and we took all of those schools and we built this massive database about all of our schools and then we went to some expert samplers. Uh, in our case, it was a firm called Westat and we worked with the Westat firm in developing 150 schools. Actually, we have more than 150 because we knew that um, much as we are good researchers and much as we have a fabulous team of people working with us, that there were going to be some school districts that just were going to say, we're too busy, we can't do this, it's too much burden, we're sorry. Or we closed and we're no longer there anymore. Or we merged and we're no longer there anymore. So that, that put us in a position where we knew that we needed what we call extra schools to be able to be used as replacement schools to what we were doing. So eventually we drew this 150 schools. Now, how does this 150 schools correspond to what we've been talking about all day long, which is our transcript study? Well, the first thing is that, think about it. And think about what Brian was telling you, what we're trying to do here. We have an interrupted time series, so that means we have to be able to look at what kids were taking before the Michigan Merit Curriculum and what kids are taking after the Michigan Merit Curriculum. That means that we have to collect course data from kids all the way back to 2003. So we have enough data points that we can look at to be able to look at what happened in 2003, 2004, 5, 6 until now we have the Michigan Merit Curriculum and now what's happening to students after that. So that means we have to go to schools and we have to go into those data banks where in fact we can get all of that information on students that went to that school from 2003. Now why do we need to do this? Well, fundamentally, the first thing that has to happen is something which we call fidelity of implementation. So what's fidelity of implementation? Essentially, that is what everybody in this room has been talking about. Are they really teaching algebra? Or are they teaching something else? So the most important thing that we are using this transcript study for, and we're trying to get textbooks and we're trying to get syllabi and of course we were going to get end of course assessments but we found out that was a lot more difficult than we thought. So um, we uh, are not getting end of course assessments although we are trying to get whatever of course assessment information we can. But the idea here is really to see in fact are we and are the students taking more advanced level courses. And this could be either a change in title or a change in content or a change in both course and content and textbook or not. So we really have to look very deeply to understand was there actually a change in what was being called algebra and if in fact we're asking for four years of a particular subject area, were the students being advanced in that particular subject area? Now, I think that all of us in this room know in fact that when we try and we know that this does happen, that people are in fact saying that they're teaching geometry and they're not really teaching geometry. And um, Jack talked about it. This is data that we know has existed for a long time. We've looked at this in some other kinds of studies um, at health. 
is a big national study and they were, um, Ken had a very big role in that and they looked at the data there. Um, one of our graduates, um, one of our postdocs right now um, was doing some work actually at Penn the University of Pennsylvania, again, looking inside these courses, and what are they seeing? And they're seeing, in fact, that the course title and what actually gets taught in the course are very different. And that work really started with, as Jack mentioned before, Bill Schmidt, because he was really started to do this work in the elementary school right around Tim's. So that's the first thing, has to do with fidelity of implementation. But there is a second reason why we have to do this. What happens if with all these great methods, and we, it turns out that courses had no difference, but the kids' scores went up anyway? Could happen, right? I mean, we don't know. Brian just told us about, you know, one cohort, you know, maybe when we look in 2012, we're going to see something very different. By having the course information, we're able to be able to understand, was it really the courses or not? And this becomes really a fundamental question that we have to ask statistically to find out if this is really something that's going to make a difference. Was it the courses or wasn't it the courses? So here we're going to be able to get the mechanisms by which this is going to occur. Now, I, um, I'm going to pull this down. I, you know what? The, the sticking is, yes. OK, there we are. <laughs> so um, here we are with the face of the person who is clearly the most important person that um, is going to help us with all of this. Now, I just want you to think about, and you can ask questions, and her team is here because um, Karen is smiling right there at me, so we're going to talk to you about all your FERPA concerns, um, you know, whether or not we have issues of confidentiality. We'll talk to you about any kinds of questions that you want to raise about the transcript study. But please, try and think about the transcript study in the context of the MMC evaluation as something that is really critical, critical in order to reach what Jack has said and for us to be able to be much more definitive in our response in terms of did the Michigan Merit curriculum really make a difference. Now, I'm going to take a little step aside before I ask for your questions because I would be remiss if I didn't talk to you a little bit more about what this 150 school sample is able to do. Um, when Vanessa was a graduate student, she came to me and said, wouldn't it be great if Michigan had a longitudinal sample of schools like we have for the National Educational Longitudinal Study? In fact, we could call it MELS, the Michigan Education Longitudinal Study. And I thought to myself, what a great idea. We're going to have all of this massive kind of data, but we couldn't really get inside a lot of these schools. So when someone raised the question before about Flint, Michigan, and does this mean that there are going to be kids in school that are going to be 21, we know they're going to be low-income schools that are going to graduate a lot of students and they're going to send them on to college, but we have to figure out what was it about those schools that really made a difference? What were the mechanisms in that school that really supported students? This 150 school sample can be used for a lot of things. And I would charge Jack and I would charge other states and say, Find a way to sample in your, in your states to build these kinds of things because these are ways that you can move in and you can look at schools in ways that you don't have to burden every person in the state. Now, what are we going to do for our schools, our 150 schools? We're going to do a lot, but one thing that we promise that we will do is, very, is something very similar to what 
the Chicago Consortium on School Research did. And that is we're going to build for you school reports, things that you want to know about your schools. We're going to tell you and we will work with you and we will show you that in ways that are transparent and easily understood so that you can take it back to your school boards, you can take it back to your personnel committees, and you'll have information about your schools that you wouldn't otherwise have, including where did your alumni go? What happened to them? How long did they persist in post-secondary education? So I'm happy to say that um, my part in this uh, discussion is now over. Um, not my part in the partnership or the collaboration. I suppose we're not really partners. We're more collaboration than partners, although we're partners as well, but it's really a consortium. And to say um, I really thank you very much, but we're here to entertain questions. And I'm happy to field whatever um, you might want to ask right now. So if you could please all just raise your hand and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Yes. So I have a question. You talked about getting the, you've talked about um, securing syllabi, books. But I wonder in many districts, since a sixth grade math teacher is not teaching the same thing in six middle schools in that district. Rarely are districts coordinating that. Um, how are you going to be able to pull apart what is teacher ability and that piece in the, in, the, in the classroom with that door shut and what actually I know where you're going. I know, no, no, I know where you're going. And it's a very important question. And I think that um, Tom Kane and a group of people that the Gates Foundation has funded is going to be able to answer that question in a way that we are not going to be able to qu answer that question. So the Gates Foundation has something called the MET Project. There's 69,000 hours of video of teachers. They're looking very hard at effective teachers. They've built teams of researchers who actually have coded that video information about effective math teachers at both the elementary and the secondary level. And that kind of information is that goes very deep in terms of what people are actually doing in their classrooms when they shut the door, regardless of the textbook that they're using, or the syllabi that they say that they're covering, or the homework assignments that they're giving, that you're going to actually be able to see what that teacher is doing in that classroom and how well he or she is structuring the lesson, whether they're doing scaffolding or they're not and how else that they're doing that at sixth grade and all the way up through high school. And for those of you in here that are interested, if you got your degree after 2007, your PhD degree after 2007, you can apply to analyze that data through the National Academy of Education. And I would suggest that you contact Brian Rowan at the University of Michigan, because he's the person that's in charge of building scholarships for people to be able to look at that data. Yes. It's called the MET project, the uh, M-E-T. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, yeah, I, I don't have my iPad and I'm like, I, I have to, I'm, my head is so on the Michigan Merit Curriculum right this minute that I'm not translating that. But measuring you, effective teachers. Uh, that's it, measuring effective teachers, sorry. <laughs> measuring effective teachers. And it's funded by the Gates Foundation. Yes, please. Do you have a concern about um, when you're doing the transcript study that you might only get districts willing to participate that actually do have their curriculum better aligned with what you might expect a, an Algebra one class to look like, for example, and maybe not a lot of districts that may not have the rigor there or the, the exact curriculum that it should be? Mm -hmm. Well, um, we built the sample with the hope and expectation that it would be representative of the state. Hopefully, we will go after every school district that we have on the file. And we will, of course, look. And we won't be able to do that from the beginning. But um, Karen, do you want to say anything about how districts have been responding? She's really has a magic touch here, so I think that it's important for her to say a few words. Thanks very much, Barbara. Um, 
Barbara and I are not related, by the way, but I'd be happy if we were. Um, I'm really, um, I'm privileged really to be part of this project, and I have a real enthusiasm for talking to each and every one of the schools that are in our sample, and I have a, had the opportunity to do that already with probably about 25 schools. So we're ramping up to reach out to all of the schools that are in the sample. Um, it's a good way to get a good look at Michigan, that's for sure. And the other thing is that we find that we have to have an individualized approach with each school that we have in our sample. Not everybody's records are in the same um, shape, uh, are all available in electronic format, for example. So I just want to assure that if you do get a phone call or someone in, in your district or um, school gets a phone call from us, that we do want to talk with you individually about how to work with you to obtain this data and what that means for the school and what it means to take part in the study. So I do appreciate everyone's attention to it too. Brian, Brian please. One thing's important, two things are important to note. I mean, this is common in most research studies, but if your school or district hasn't been part of it, uh, part of one you may not know. One, all the data will be uh, confidential and anonymous. You, a district that doesn't feel like they've done as well as they would like to, there will be nothing in the paper saying, District X, we found after analyzing this is the lowest district in the state on the, I mean, all of it, uh, I mean, kind of the doctoral students and researchers will, you know, look at it, but when it kind of comes out and we uh, present results, they'll be kind of in general um, format, kind of for the state of this or for, you know, districts and, you know, kind of, you know, with these characteristics, but always in kind of large enough groups so that no one district and certainly no one school is ever singled out. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that we, luckily through the funding, uh, through IES, we have funding to compensate schools if there's any kind of time required um, to pull some of this data together. And our, our initial investigations have shown that most Almost all schools and districts have the trans most of their transcript data, even going back for many years, in some form of electronic files. Um, but if you are worried that, oh no, it's ours are on this kind of drive that has to be transferred over here to do this, and where are we going to find time for someone to do that? Um, you won't have to. We have Karen, and Karen has dozens of people that will gladly do that um, and that's where the funding through IES, IES is important because we know that school folks don't have the time or money to do some of this themselves. So two, two important things to keep in mind. And we should say um, also that what we're, um, again, we're working with NCES on this as well because um, what we're trying to do with the coding of the transcripts and the course titles is to make that transparent so that um, the kind of coding scheme that we put together will be usable for other states, uh, especially as we move towards the common standards that um, our hope and expectation and we've been doing just a little bit of experimenting right now with some transcript data that we currently have we've been doing some reliability studies in other words you know if two people you know look at it do they come up with the same um, kind of code for the same course um, one thing that has happened um, since I first started working with transcript data from the 1980s is that um, there actually is uh, less of uh, the variability that there was at the time, if you recall, when uh, Brian put up that thing called a nation at risk. And so there has been some kind of movement, especially within the last six or seven years, towards more common titles. Um, Again, that doesn't mean that they're teaching that, but it certainly is the case that we're moving towards more common titles. So um, we're thinking right now that that's going to be not as difficult a task, and we're hoping that the codes that we put together will be codes that other states will be able to use. And all of our decision rules for where we put a particular course, 
how, what kinds of decision rules we have to make. One of the things that we're finding out right now is much to, at least my surprise, there's still a lot of schools that um, have three trimesters instead of two semesters. And so um, you actually have three semesters of a particular course over the course of a year instead of two. So um, how do you change that and how do you make them equivalent so that you're actually looking at you know, a certain half of the year in Algebra 1 and then the second half of the year in Algebra 1. So um, we have to be able to have decision rules on that. Um, and that will become one of the things that we hope, again, will be, we'll be able to make more transparent. Yes. This is a bit of a broader question. Um, when I think about consortium work, and I think it's amazing that this consortium work is happening the way it is. I'm wondering if you thought about partnering a little more um, intentionally with the ISDs in Michigan, since we now have these data systems that, you know, we've been working very hard to have the school consortiums working with us as ISDs. And I think we have access to a lot of the data, maybe down a little bit closer to the student than maybe you realize, or maybe you know that. Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of the larger consortium work and that possibility. And, um, I, yes. 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 Well, I know, but I want to, um, I, but I want to talk a little bit more about that because I think, um, Sue, if that's okay. But, but if I'm, if I'm, if I'm missing something or I'm saying something wrong, correct me, please. But um, when we were thinking about first doing this transcript study, um, actually Brian Rowan is the kind of person that's in charge of this. And his initial uh, image was that we were going to go to the ISDs. And we went to, in fact, um, we did an ISD study last summer where, in fact, we went to all of the ISDs and we were trying to find out where the transcript data were and also how many of the ISDs collected end of course assessments or had their own course end of course assessments. And we found a lot of variability um, among the ISDs, a lot more I, uh, a variability than we had expected. Um, and um, we still are, uh, of course, in the situation of wanting to work very much with the ISDs because we know that some of the transcripts are held with the ISDs. We also know that some of the end of course information is with the ISDs. And we also know that the ISDs can be great partners with us in um, having districts and schools participate in the transcript study. And this is a way also that if you have particular information that you want to share with us that we can append to our already existing files, that that would be a great way to move and get more information. I just had a question. Um, there's a lot of talk right now about um, uh, moving to the Common Core and how to meet all efficiently and maybe uh, the integration is a really great way to do it, project-based learning. Um, are you taking those kinds of models into consideration in your 150, talking about variability in the 150 schools that you're sampling? Yes. And um, the other thing is we, we talked about uh, a lot about standards um, based um, re reporting mm -hmm. um, versus grading uh, and end of course. Um, and so you're going to see a little bit of that at least probably. And um, but there's a lot of interest in it because it's an efficient means and it puts students into an inquiry mode instead of um, the traditional uh, course. And, and thank you very much for your comments. So let me just talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing with the 150 schools because it isn't just getting the transcripts and it's not just, you know, collecting things. One of the things that we would very much like to do with, I think you heard, uh, before is we'd like to interview the teachers and the principals and uh, I know that Brian and Ken both have real interests in how we push forward on this. So probably one of the first things that we'll start doing is in addition to sitting and building um, models that make sense in terms of trying to understand what's actually going on in the schools as teachers have in fact and principals have made school organizational patterns change to meet the Mer Michigan Merit Curriculum. 
We'll also want to get some other kinds of information. So probably we'll be holding what we call focus groups with teachers and principals and talking through some of these issues about what kinds of things we really need to be looking at and looking at more closely, what kinds of questions we really need to be asking to get at some of these things. It's very clear that it's much harder to deal with project data when we're looking at the transcript data. We're, of course, looking at Carnegie units. We're looking at course titles, and we're looking at grades. So that, in fact, that really stops if, in fact, no letter grade, if it's just a pass-fail. Of course, if it's just a pass-fail, we'll have that information as well. But there might be other kinds of things that we really need to know about, and there might be some things that um, it might be worthwhile to talk to people that are collecting transcript transcript data that they really need to make some sort of amendments. I think that the superintendent really pointed out, and I think it's very important for all of us to remember that schools are dynamic places. They don't stand still. They're fluid. Their grading practices change. Things change. What they consider to be part of a curriculum makes a difference. And we have to be attentive to those kinds of things. And we have to be responsive to those kinds of things. And they may, in fact, make it for us to have to look at other kinds of things. But right now, this is sort of the plan that we're going with. And if things change dramatically, we will, of course, make changes ourselves. We wanted to get you all real early in the morning when you were all bright and had lots to say, fill you with information, not, you know, and we kind of figured that we would end um, a little sooner than later. And we did it quite deliberately because we really wanted to make sure that we got our message out and it didn't become one where, you know, we got into a whole lot of issues that we really couldn't answer very well. But I would like to say that, um, the issue about um, staying connected, we have a website um, and we are open. Uh, we answer questions and um, I would like to say that please, you know, come to our website, come to us, talk to us, uh, talk to Karen. Um, this will be as good a project as all of us can make it and I hope you all will participate and before we close, um, it's important that I say one little thing, uh, which is that Brian has been in sunny California on sabbatical this year. Uh, he's been very active and um, we've been Skyping with him regularly. So he's not off the hook and as you could tell, he's very much involved in what we're doing. But um, Sue has really had to shoulder the majority of the work associated with this meeting, which in my mind has turned out to be a great success. And Julie, and Christina, and Steve, and Rachel, and Beth, um, and of course, our fabulous team of researchers. Um, but um, I think, Sue, we all owe you a special round of applause, and thank you very much.